Um, please accept my apologies. Uh, I've been running into a few technical issues this morning. I hope you can see my screen as well. Yeah, definitely. Okay, yeah. perfect. Um, so um, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Khaled Chalan. I'm a core research solutions consultant at Elsevier in Africa. Um, today, I'm going to be talking with you a little bit on uh, introductory, uh, an introduction uh, webinar on tips for accessing research funding. Um, today, we're going to be covering three angles. So the first angle are tips and advice for preparing a grant proposal. The second one, we're going to visit it a bit quickly because it's a bigger topic on its own, but we're going to focus on the funding aspects on building collaborations. And the third thing, we are going to talk about uh, how research metrics could uh, enhance your funding proposal. Um, with that, let me ask you, and if you can uh, answer on chat, um, if you have um, tried to apply for a funding grant before, for. Um, let's see if you can, um, let's see if there are um, how many people we have on board who has even attempted to um, write a grant proposal before. Anyone on chat? Okay, I'm seeing people responding now. Uh, somebody's telling me that they have tried, but it wasn't very successful. And um, that's very common. So it's, it's actually, there are very low acceptance rates when it comes to proposal grants, no matter how, you, uh, how much of an expert you are on your field, everybody gets shot down. Uh, a lot of times it's, it's uh, the norm is actually getting rejected, not getting accepted for a grant, no matter how big uh, and, uh, and well established you are uh, academically. Okay. Um, some people mentioned halt price, so that's uh, more of a business uh, proposal there. All right. So um, allow me to just um, as as a quick introduction. So um, it, it it is it can be a little bit hectic to uh, apply for funding. Usually that consumes a lot of time from researchers worldwide and um, everywhere, uh, everywhere you can see that professors are more and more spending time towards gathering fund uh, than, actually, um, than actually getting the fund themselves. So it's becoming more and more competitive. You can see people spending uh, a lot of time into it. So if you look into it a little bit, you can see that looking for a funding uh, call takes a lot of time in its own. So just to figure out which opportunity is best suited for you. Uh, another thing is that you can find that planning the proposal itself would take some other time, uh, about 25% of the time you will be doing. And the huge chunk will be writing the technical narrative and Writing the um, writing the pro, uh, the grant proposal itself, and um, about ten percent uh, will go for administrative parts. And um, so, for example, if you are applying for a funding grant, you are looking usually for um, you are usually looking for a mandate to be coming out of your institution. Um, there you should have, um, so that kind of paperwork you do within your institution, your other uh, partners across their institutions as well, will be having to do the same. And there is the part which can be a bit of time consuming, to be very honest, on the submission portal itself. Usually submission portals for funding grants um, could take a bit of time. Uh, to get into it. So um, there is always the advice if you have, uh, uh, when you have an, uh, a grant deadline to actually start planning very early ahead. Do not leave yourself to the last minute. Trust me, I've tried it myself. 
it was very difficult because the submission portals usually require in a lot of documents uploading those documents could take time uh, and um, you would want to finish this as soon as possible as you can stay clear as much as possible of the deadline itself and expect to run into a lot of glitches when you are um, submitting your grant so before embarking onto a granting project know that it will it will take a lot of considerable time to get that grant proposal prepared and ready so that brings us to the question so what is a fundable grant idea itself when do i know that i have an idea that i can attract funding for and there are a few things that you need to want uh, to answer yourself before you get into it so one idea is that how much this idea is interesting and who cares about it. It's very, very important to identify who could be the stakeholders who will take interest in your uh, of your work, who will benefit if this work is successful. And um, another thing is how crazy that idea is. While there are no hard and fast rules about that, different agencies have different appetite for risk. So you have to understand that some funders would like a more conservative idea, but other funders would definitely be uh, very interested into um, exciting ideas and have a, a bigger appetite uh, for risk. So for example, in USA, the Defense, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA, often funds blue sky type projects or that are on the verge of being physically impossible but they like to take those kinds of risks for example but on the other hand if you are looking at the public uh, at the national institutes of health or the nih they have a reputation for funding projects that have a higher probability of success so it's very important to understand a little bit of the mindset of your funder as well Another question is, you have to showcase why are you the best person to do this? So if there are a lot of researchers working on the same idea, you need to start answering a little bit in your head. What kind of edge you do have? Usually, funding agencies do like to fund winners. So the more convincing your case can, the better chances you will be when you start applying. And the final question that you need to ask, and we find this sadly happening in a lot of cases, can I realistically do what I'm promising given the time and resources I can realistically acquire? And that is a little bit of a, a, um, a hard to swallow pill, if I may ask. Um, so the idea here is that usually if you are uh, an academic a professor, for example, then you have a lot on your platter. There is a lot to do. Uh, you do have your commitments. And also, you are faced by the limitation of your institution itself. We have seen cases before where you are applying for idea that will require a lot of support from your institution internally or support from uh, gov from governmental agencies to for permissions, for example, or for procurement of materials. And um, you apply for that grant idea, you're accepted for it, but there are other limitations that you are uh, that you miss out on. Um, and a case that I've seen personally is that um, I know somebody who's been working on a biotech project, and um, they needed uh, sam they needed to uh, materials and samples. Some of them are biohazard materials to be imported to their lab when they couldn't get uh, clearances to import those kind of biohazard materials. It needed a lot of uh, governmental approvals. When they weren't able to secure those governmental approvals, that killed the project itself. And it was really bad when you are promising something to a funder and then you fail to deliver because of some limitations you could not think of earlier that will dissuade the funders from trusting you with more grants to come again. So it's, it's very important um, to, to know that you can deliver on what you are promising with a grant. Usually funders will use review panels that are uh, experts and seasoned professionals. Um, they are usually very well aware of the realities in lab. 
but it's very important to not buy it more than you can actually chew when it comes to it. So when you are looking for a funding opportunity, the first thing that you should be looking for is during doing the literature discovery part of your research. So while you are searching for um, papers, for example, you need to start establishing patterns because in a research paper, people, uh, authors will have to acknowledge their funders. So whenever you're reading papers in your field, it's very important to look into the acknowledgement sections and check who is funding this kind of research and who is interesting in this, who is interested in this research. If you are using, uh, for example, Scopus, for instance, there are filters on Scopus that can, when you are looking for a specific, for specific keywords and you're getting million, hundreds of results, thousands of results, tens of thousands, you can always ask Scopus to give you a statistic about the research funders that are funding this kind of research. So that helps you a little bit to understand um, who, uh, who is interested in funding research for your field. Um, you should, uh, once you know who are the funders interested in your field, you should start looking uh, on their websites for available calls. There are services online that will uh, develop some sort of search engines or will start including data about as many funders uh, as they can get, and maybe it's doing you giving you analysis on what those how those funders work. Um, for example, in Elsevier, we have a solution for it called Funding Institutional. But in all cases, once you have your targets, who your research funders for, you should start scanning for the available uh, calls that they have. One other thing that is very important here is be willing to cast a wider net. Um, one of the key points that we would like to share here, so people usually look for funders within their countries, but they are a bit unaware that they might be eligible for funding opportunities with funders in other locations. For example, funders based in Europe or USA, because uh, um, there is usually more funds available for research there. Um, and, and let me tell you that in some cases, so for example, um, some funders would uh, approve of a principal investigator or the one leading the funded research projects. Um, they could, uh, you could, it, it, you could be eligible to be a principal investigator for a funded project that's funded by a funding agency uh, overseas. Some other times, you could be a partner in a re, uh, in uh, a research consortium, provided that the principal investigator uh, meets specific criteria and you meet the criteria for co-PIs. Uh, or uh, or uh, partners within the within the research consortium or the research team that is applying for the grant itself. Um, the point about using funding search tools, as mentioned, so we already have funding an institutional tool, which is a, a subscription-based tool to help with funding uh, with searching for funding opportunities. Um, there are other, um, alternatively, you can start using search engines, which could help as well, help you find out uh, about funding opportunities that are available. Important thing is to keep your mind open um, and keep your network very vast because if you are already building collaborations with other people, as we will mention, you can find that they are looking for calls themselves and usually, trust me on this, people need international collaborators as much as we do need them. So for example, if I, uh, a professor who's based, for example, in Europe, applying for a prestigious European grant, for example, something like Horizon 2020, having a collaborator from Kenya or from Nigeria is actually enriching. It makes him look better for funders that he has international collaborations. And especially if those researchers coming from um, different countries have something unique and characteristic to bring into to bring into the research team. It's either um, it, it's very important, and we will revisit that point again when we are discussing collaborations uh, in research opportunities. When you find a good opportunity 
for a funding, very important is to read the call very, very carefully. There are a lot of things in fine print that you do not want to miss out on the official description for a funding. Once you have a good understanding of the funder, of what they are looking for when they are announcing a grant, um, try to tailor your idea to the call goals. If you can tailor your idea to be a perfect fit for the call, is, then you have very higher chance to actually um, secure that funding yourself. One pitfall to watch here is you should not modify your idea so that it's barely recognizable. Otherwise, you won't have fun doing it. And three or four years uh, of a commitment to a funder is a very long time to work on something that you are not interested in. So you want to tailor your idea to match the funder expectation, but you do not want to uh, modify it so much that you lose your own interest uh, for the commitment itself. Once again, if you have everything set, read the call again. If you have prepared your entire, once you have prepared your entire proposal, read the call a third time before you submit, just to make sure that everything you have is in line with what the funder is looking for. When you are reading the call, it's important to look for deadlines for eligibility requirements and any additional requirements. Does the call mention matching funds for example, so matching funds, that meaning that means that a funder is going to give you, for example, uh, 1,000, uh, sorry, $100,000. If you are, if your research institution is willing to match, for example, by 5%, or uh, it's, uh, it's a co-governmental, uh, it's an international, uh, it's an international grant uh, that is set to be, uh, for example, uh, based on collaboration between two governments. Some other grants want to have partners. So in the research consortia or the teams you're building for the funded project should have, uh, some, some funders would require that you have a private sector or industrial fund partners. And sometimes they would just give out the fund or ask, ask them for matching funds as well. Another important thing, support letters. What kind of letters uh, you would need for support from your institution, for example? Um, do they require additional institutional commitments? So for example, in a lot of cases, you can see that, um, for example, uh, um, uh, the head of your institution uh, should sign something called a declaration on honor, for example. A declaration on honor, it's when the institution is actually being, uh, is committing and uh, announcing liability for the funds you are about to receive yourself, for example. So all of these things take time to arrange. So it's not, it's best not to discover them at the last minute. Finally, we um, finally I would want to remind you again about the time it takes to write the grant. Start early. Writing a grant proposal out of my own personal experience could take. I would say it. Um, you would need to prepare if you are already very well aware about the process and you are an ex you have experience in writing grant proposals. I would say the minimum you would would want to look into is about a quarter, three months. Um, some grants would require even more time. Um, less than that, you would be pushing it a little bit. Uh, then again, it depends on the, um, there is some variance you can see to the numbers I'm, say, I'm saying because some uh, funding opportunities are micro funds uh, or individual fund for a researcher, then that usually have lesser deadline. You find the announcement, for example, less than two months before the deadline because um, they do not have much requirements to put into the uh, funding proposal there as well. Um, sorry. So one important thing, uh, and we're going to be visiting that point again, uh, is have you got the right team for it? 
Um, so some calls are very specific to what disciplines or skills that they would want to pull in. Um, there, here you can see on screen an example from a, re, uh, from a National Science Foundation solicitation. So this is a call for funds by the NSF in, in USA that says very clearly that one of the senior investigators has to be from a bioengineering field, for example. So this, uh, uh, some of these, for example, uh, are research. So that's a research topic into bioelectronics system. But they are telling you that the PI or one of the co-PIs must be from bioengineering discipline. The remaining could be from biotechnology, for example, or biology or other fields as well. But sometimes you face those kinds of requirements there. Um, so that means that, for example, if you have a team who's very experienced in this, uh, who are very experts when it comes to biosensors, but they come from a chemistry background, um, they would still need to have the right team for it. On other cases, on other calls that I've seen would ask for uh, collaborators from SMEs uh, or startups. Um, some other calls would require uh, certain geographical diversity, for example, and so forth. So it's important to check into those requirements as well. Important thing is to understand the funding agencies because as we mentioned, different funding agencies have different styles. Uh, I'm gonna show you a bit of examples from three uh, major funders in, in USA. Then again, uh, there is a lot of abundance for research funds in, in especially in USA and China. So I'm going to be using those more of as examples. And um, also another point I would like to draw your attentions to, attention to sometimes uh, international uh, researchers could be eligible for these, or you could be eligible for one of those funding institute for one of those funding grants if you have a collaborator that's based in the U.S., for example. Um, so it is really impossible to go over every agency. But these are really an examples. So for example, an NSF grant should always emphasize the basic science. It's called the National Science Foundation and they always look for emphasizing basic science and education opportunities. A connection to a broad, uh, to the broad area of healthcare is very important if you are applying for the Nation, uh, National Institutes of Health, for example. Um, people sometimes say that an ideal NIH application has to have someone uh, die in the beginning and have somebody be cured at the end. Uh, so the technological possibilities, the clear milestones and significant practical impact are some of the requirements uh, for a DARPA application, for example, and emphasizing basic science is a poor recipe for, uh, for success with a sponsor that looks for practical applications by the end of the day. So I'm just gonna go quickly with examples on these, but um, trust that these do apply for uh, multiple, uh, for other institutions as well. So um, the NSF main mission statement is to promote the progress of science to advance national health, the nation health prosperity and welfare to secure the national defense and for other purposes. Um, so usually your, your research idea has to match the kind of expectation that this funder would be looking for. Um, another example here, Sorry. The NIH, for example, the mission is to seek fundamental knowledge about the nature and behavior of living systems and the application of that knowledge to enhance health, lengthen life, and reduce the burden of illness and disability. So that's another example. Then again, I'm not saying that strictly you should um, apply for these kind of institutions. I'm just giving you an example of how, what kind of goals and mission to seek whenever you're looking for a funder. That funder could be something in your country, for example, that fund in, in, uh, in, in Nigeria, for example, or um, SDF, for example, in Egypt, uh, royal, um, uh, royal grants, for example, in some of the kingdoms in Africa, for example. So it's, it's very important to know exactly what the mission statements and goals are for these kind of uh, funding agency you are looking for. 
One important thing and, and an important tip here is you should try to contact the program manager before you start writing your application. Grant calls include the contact information for a reason. So try to use it. Program managers seldom answer emails. So instead, pick up the phone and call. They are used to getting cold calls uh, all the time. Cold calls are when you're calling someone who, uh, when you are calling someone who is not, uh, who you don't know already. So you're making an introduction and uh, introducing yourself. Um, I believe there has been a bit of an issue with the screen sharing. Uh, can you see my screen now? Yes, we can see it. Yes, sprinkling. we can see it, yes. So yes, we uh, can. how far into the presentation did the screen go out? No, 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 it's beyond. Okay. The screen is been on from the beginning. Okay, okay. Perfect. So um, as I told you, program managers are used to getting cold calls and um, will likely be happy to talk to you. So be realistic about what you can get from those calls as, um, for example, program managers probably won't tell you whether they will fund your idea or not. So don't try to ask that question, really. Um, so they are trying to be neutral to everyone. And also they have specialized review teams built of experts in the fields to on, to actually check those kind of uh, proposals of proposals before they give decisions pms will probably tell you if the broad idea fits within their program vision or not so there is a difference between telling them uh, is this idea is this an idea that you will fund uh, uh, will you fund my idea, for example, is a very different question is, do you feel that this idea lies within the scope of your, uh, of your call or your program vision or not, for example? Um, sometimes they will give you hints on how to best tailor your idea to fit the call. So really here, remember that you can always reach to the program manager. And um, before you dial, however, do some background work and be prepared with a list of questions. You want to do a, maybe a little bit of a background check to see who the program manager is, if they are coming from a research background, for example, or um, maybe check, check them out on LinkedIn and so forth to have a little bit of understanding to their background. And you have to read the call very carefully before, also before calling them. You do not waste their time into things that they have announced on the call or even on the FAQs uh, on the call website as well. Oh, sorry. Uh... So, um, one important point to know that your proposal is going to be reviewed. It's going to be reviewed by peers, uh, by peers, other researchers or experts in your field. Uh, there are mandatory review criteria and sometimes those reviews work on uh, multiple steps. Um, so sometimes, um, so some grants, for example, will have uh, the application being run on multiple cycles. So you can have an initial proposal that is when reviewed, for example, they will ask you to prepare the full proposal uh, ideas. So, so you have a basic proposal to submit. Once reviewed, you will be invited to go for the second round, for example. And it's a multiple step process in, in a lot of cases, as mentioned. During the review process, reviewers consider the mandatory criteria. They are provided a proposal scoring or rating form and are instructed to review proposals based on how well the mandatory review criteria are met. This form of review allows for an element of standardization and reduces the risk level from, for example, uh, from bias or, or similar as well. It's important to get the bad, right background information. Before writing uh, uh, a review for the literature, for example, always do the literature search, search because it can save you 
painful weeks of writing and worse, an embarrassment if you actually submit a proposal and you find out that what you are, what you are seeking fun to do is something that has already been done. Um, sponsors like to find winners when it comes to it and they expect you to be an expert in your field so it's it's very true also for review panels so my point is you do not want to look like not an expert in your field because you're missing out on research that has been done in the field itself um, they usually while reviewers could know nothing about your specific work but uh everything about the work your competitors are doing so don't give them a chance to shoot down your proposal for that useful source for finding literature for example our scopus if you have access to it it's the largest abstract and citation database of peer-reviewed literature um, science direct is home to almost one quarter of the world's peer-reviewed full text uh, or one-fifth of the world's peer-reviewed full text scientific technical and medical content so you want to check these resources and you want to check across the entire academic field what's going on uh, you could also seek out help from mendeley catalog which is a search engine uh, or google or google scholar and and similar so search engines can help with that as well. Curiously, you should not expect the panel members to be experts in your field. So you have to make sure that you can put your idea into the broader context of things, especially uh, it depends on really the scope of the funder. So if, if somebody is, um, if the call uh, of the, if the call that you found is specific to fund research in a specific research field. So for example, um, a call that will fund uh, uh, projects into stem cell research, when I'm applying for this kind of funding opportunity, um, I do not want to spend a lot of time explaining what stem cells are. But if, for example, if I have um, uh, a funding opportunity that's called innovation in science, for example, and it's a broad scope, multidisciplinary kind of call, for example, yeah, I would want to give uh, my reviewers a little bit of a background about my field as well. So just try to match that when you are writing it. The first reality check that you would need to do is task versus time. So write down a brief list of tasks and, the prop, uh, and an approximate timeline for the research you're going to do. Identify how the tasks fit together and how much time it would take to execute them. Another reality check, resources versus budgets. So write down a list of resources and a rough budget estimation for these and check that the scope of your work matches your resources. Another thing is delivery. Can I do this work on time and on budget? Because funders will give you a specific budget and if you, you cannot go beyond the budget that they have set for the project itself. If not, start thinking about hiring additional people and whether the project budget can accommodate those people or not. So you expand your team, you size your team based on delivery versus budget here as well. And um, important thing to know, please know that you will have overheads when it comes to your budget. Um, a lot of institutions uh, will, uh, will get a cut out of the funding uh, going to research labs. So for example, I'm working in University X um, and uh, my lab, we just applied for uh, funding from uh, from the European Commission, for example. And um, I would so that funding is one million euros, for example. I would expect that the university will get a cut for overheads from that funding. So I, for example, that could that overhead could be maybe ten or twenty percent, depending on uh, the university itself, because there are a lot of administrative effort that will be done by the university by different staff in the university. So these are overheads, for example, you have to look for and you have to check um, about the policy in your institution as well. An important thing is to give time, to give accommodation for contingencies, time to procure equipment and hire people, consider equipment downtime and other contingencies that might arise as well. So uh, when you are writing the grant proposal, start with an outline. 
So you put your ideas into just an outline at first and then read the call again. So sometimes there are specific sections or a specific structure that they will mandate and check if there are significances be differences between your outline and the uh, and the call requirements again. Allow enough time for writing. Grants are like an ideal gas. They fill all the space time av available to them. So then again, um, if you are giving your uh, yourself three months to write the grant proposal, it will take the three months. If you are starting early on, then it will take that time. It will take four months or five months, but you'll come up with probably something better and stronger uh, to uh, to apply to submit to your funder. Um, so you usually your uh, proposal is um, main questions to an answer. So what problems are you addressing? Why is it important? Who will benefit and who cares? Uh, what have you and others done up to now to address this problem? Why hasn't it been solved yet? Why is it difficult? What's the current? So usually that comes in the state of the art section. Um, and then you would, how would you plan to address it? What's your method? Uh, why do you think that this will succeed? What's your hypothesis to start with? Um, what's your work plan? And you need to divide your work plan into milestones. I'm going to achieve X, and then we're going to achieve Y and Z and so forth. And very important is to be very quantitative uh, as much as possible, uh, to have measures and KPIs, key performance indicators to measure your success with the research itself. When you are writing, write very clearly. Target a technical person who is not an expert in your field and ask them to read what you're writing. So usually if they can get a good a idea of what you're writing, then that's good. Outline your hypothesis very clearly. And very, very important, if you have already done some investigations or some efforts into uh, the research topic that you want to seek the fund for. So if you have preliminary data, and I would say you always should, Make sure that the reader knows that it is your data. So try to um, try to differentiate your own previous work that you've done uh, related to the uh, proposal topic from the data you are getting uh, or what others are doing as well. And very important, outline the experiments that you want to do. A lot of funders might have restrictions, for example, for human testing or animal testing uh, and so forth. And um, and I, it would be, uh, so for example, if you're doing uh, experiments uh, in vivo, for example, um, they might have, uh, apart from the general guidelines for animal testing, for example, they might have even more strict guidelines at times as well. Be kind to your reviewers. So do not use tiny fonts, leave ample margins, highlight the key points and write the review for reviewers themselves. So. Just try to make it more readable and much easier for people to walk through your uh, proposal as well. Um, once again, write the review for the reviewer. Be very clear, the significance, the feasibility, the outcome. Use those words and maybe name the name subheadings uh, based on these. What the innovation is, what's new, what's the transformation or the impact it could bring. Um, Clearly, so you want this to be readable. People will look for those keywords while they are reading your proposal. Uh, what's your environment or the uh, or the ecosystem that you're working with? Uh, how it will help support and uh, how it will advance knowledge and have a broader impact uh, out of this project. So these are very important keywords to use when you are run writing your grant proposal. And don't assume everything would will work like a charm, it rarely does. So all the Murphy laws that you know of will happen when you are writing your grant proposal. Uh, there are, uh, and when you are going on to the project itself, so it rarely does. It's handling, you will have to handle probably a lot of disturbances 
even during writing and even much more during the execution of your project. So include a discussion in your proposal, how you're going to handle risk factors, be honest about your risks. Um, you would want, so trust me, the worst case scenario that could happen out of, a, out of uh, applying for a funding is when you actually get the fund, but you fail to deliver by the end of time. Um, and trust me, the, uh, I've worked with, with very famous professors in the fields, for example, and I have seen them writing down grant proposals and getting rejected for them. It happens to everyone in academia, no matter how big or famous you are in your field, it, it always happens. But the worst thing that could happen is not the rejection, that's very normal, very common, and happens all the time. But the very worst thing that could happen is when you fail actually to deliver the work that you've promised again. Um, when you are writing your proposal, work on your figures. Figures need to be clear, informative, of high quality and readable. Uh, include informative captions. Include milestones, timelines, and references. Uh, use a Gantt chart, for example. Um, some agencies insist on very quantitative milestones, as I've mentioned, and make them a go-no-go -go decision. So if you do not have something measurable, for example, for those funders, um, they will not accept it. Um, include a detailed timeline, for example, using a Gantt chart to visualize the timeline you're describing and make sure the references are in order. So it's, it would be a very nice point to use a, a reference manager such as Mendeley or, or others as well. Make your narrative writing lucid. So avoid the passive voice, be original in your writing and tell a story. Um, so tell people why this would be interesting and exciting, um, lead them through it. Be original in your writing. Um, read the call again uh, on multiple. So take checkpoints in your proposal and compare them to the call itself. If you want to reuse parts of your older grants, make sure they fit. And that's very important because, for example, if you have spent three months writing a proposal and it got rejected, uh, because you needed fund to do your lab work, uh, for example, on uh, on a new um, energy generation method, for example. Um, so, and you got shut down. So you found another funder with a similar call or a nearby call. So it's very common to actually reuse the old uh, um, parts from your older proposal to resubmit them again, but just make sure that they fit and watch for the items specific to older grants in those texts. So you don't want to find a part uh, where you are submitted uh, a proposal and then at the mid part of it, you are comparing what you are doing to the objectives of the funder and you're talking about another funder, for example. So while this seems very clear, but within the pressure of writing a grant proposal, it happens, sadly. And don't forget the broader impact sections. They do matter. Try to propose ideas uh, that do make sense. Um, don't use just um, um, boilerplate kind of impact. So just very generic uh, sense of words um, to it. Reviewers have to, uh, trust me, the reviewers have read the boilerplate parts many, many times before, and they will not be impressed if you're just reusing them again. Uh, for the administrative parts, read the call. They are usually required about the forms that they will require. Required and must include means just that. So you must include those items if there are specific documents you need to provide, for example, from your institution. Work on your budgets and other documents in advance. The administrative staff at your institution won't work overnight for your grant, so give them enough time. And be mindful of internal deadlines. Some institutions will tell you, okay, if you want us to sign a specific mandate, for example, uh, give us a head time for, of one week, for example. Also, if you need external letters, give people time to get them to you. So. It's, it's another point, just make sure that you'll get your paperwork in order with the right time. Come up with the right budget, so be frugal and realistic. Don't forget to write the detailed budget justification. 
If you have subcontracts, then make sure their budgets are in proper format as well. Another point that people sometimes miss out on, um, some funders, for example, would require that you publish gold open access, uh, for example. So if, if they are asking you to publish gold open access, usually publishing gold open access would require funding. Uh, would require to pay an APC, so you need to make sure that you have included this as a budget line uh, in your project, for example. Um, one very important thing, and, and it's very common sentence, submit and forget. So make sure that when you are submitting your proposal, you have enough time to upload the files. I've seen it uh, happened before when we were submitting and the submission and uploading the files took over 15 minutes and we only had 20 minutes on the clock. That's very bad. Never do that. Um, check PDFs for readability and errors. Upload a near final copy early because agency systems get busy during submission times. Um, sometimes that delay could be because a lot of people are submitting their proposals at the same time. So if there is a possibility to upload an early version and then to upload a final version before the deadline, then definitely do that if you can uh, update the copy that you have uploaded. Forget about the proposal until you hear from the review panel. And trust me, when you are submitting a proposal, you have to be a bit convinced that it's more likely that you will get uh, rejected than accepted just Submit and forget about it until you hear from the review panel. If you are rejected, then it happens. That's the really the norm statistically. Uh, you are more likely to get rejected than accepted. It happens all the time, but just don't let this hold you back. Always apply. It's always a no until you ask, until you submitted that proposal idea. And if you got shot down, they will give you feedback and review. You can use that and leverage that to apply either at the same funder again or at another funder as well. But remember that you only need to have a funded project running and then it will secure you funds for a year, two or three uh, as well. So make sure that uh, agency communications do not get filtered in your spam folder as well and use your review as mentioned, uh, it will help you prepare even better grants as time goes. So I'm gonna go with a few quick tips. So know the funders priorities, seek out the most winnable funding opportunities. So um, based on, uh, and so that really is based on uh, the qualification criteria that would be needed. Uh, grants come in many shapes and size, sizes. For example, um, in one of the countries I work with in Africa, I was speaking to a deputy minister who's telling me everybody's competing for the big grants, for the ones with millions, and uh, nobody is applying for early career grants, for example, that are uh, much smaller in size. And by the end of the day, they have a lot of budget uh, allocated for the smaller grants, but since nobody applies for the smaller ones, they get unused. And he was telling me that we had 20 uh, early career uh, grants in the last quarter, and only seven people applied for those, whereas hundreds applied for three grants that will come in multi-millions, for example. Um, keep updated on changes to a funding call. Uh, if you're using funding institutional from Elsevier, it, there is a track opportunity uh, available on it. Seek potential collaborators. Um, so that's a very important point to mention here. Uh, always look for other experts in your field, filter down people who are notable in your field and try to build a connection with them. Some people are responsive for emails, for example, if you're trying to connect with an author and it's a very good starting point to get to know someone to tell them, you are an expert in the field, I'm working on the same field, let's 
apply for funding together. Everybody's looking for funding and international collaboration just makes it way, way better. Very important, leverage your conference and your personal network when it comes to it, how you can network personally with other people as well. And I will tell you a successful conference visit is the one where you have, when you go back to your uh, office and you already have business cards of other people who ha you already have discussed that let's go write a grant proposal when we are back home as well. Sell your big idea. So uh, by keywords, you can uh, actually do that and filter out who's going to be interested in your big idea as well and learn from other people grants. So there is a website, it's a very interesting website called O-Grants. It's part of Open Science Initiatives. People actually upload uh, the proposal that they have uh, written and uh, got a grant for. So everybody, so it's public and a lot of funders would say publicly, we are funding Professor X from Y University. Uh, but you will not be able to see the grant proposal that they have written themselves. So O grants is where you go and say, I got this grant and this was my winning proposal for it. So it's a very important um, it's it's a very important thing to see what worked. So for example, if I'm applying for a grant with WWF, I would want to see a successful grant that was accepted by the WWF, for example. And let funding opportunities finding find you. If you are visible enough, sometimes you will get emails from funders telling you about the call. One good idea to do this is to update your Scopus author profile. Whether or not you have a subscription to Scopus, the free layer of Scopus, Scopus Preview, allows you to search for your own profile in Scopus and do any updates to it as well. And um, usually if you are doing a search, for example, so make sure that you know the query or, or if there is an option to save search so you can always look again for opportunities the same way. For visibility and collaborations, I'm gonna be very brief with this because we've discussed some aspects of it. Your own visibility is very important to build your collaborations. Having a web page, uh, having a, a web page on your university's website and an institutional profile. So if there is a page on your university website that talks about you, it gives you much more credibility and visibility if people are looking you up on Google, for example. Um, having an institutional repository, if there are other papers that you are working on uh, as preprints, for example, that are stored on your university website or a, or a preprint server like SSRN or archive, uh, for example, these will give visibility not just to your published work, but to the work you're currently preparing as well. Social media presence uh, and networking via social media with other academics. Uh, acad Twitter is insanely popular with a lot of researchers. So, and, and they network together very strong, strongly using it. Your LinkedIn profile and maintaining your Scopus profile and matching it with an ORCID is also very important. Um, important point here is to use your personal contact and networking, present your work face-to-face -face during conferences, Tons of networking, as I told you, if you are going back home with already seeds for joint collaborations on funded projects, then you have had a successful conference. Um, go visit other universities, talk about your work and connect with professors in those universities. Um, we are in the pandemic, as you see, I'm working from home. So you can present your work electronically uh, grow your own network of collaborators and maybe sometimes highlight your best work in your email signature, for example. Social media, again, it's very important to look into the social media. Um, globally, Reddit and Twitter are increasing influence in, uh, in academia as well. AMAs, Ask Me Anythings are becoming more and more popular as well. So, um, this brings us to the last section and I'm going to be very brief. Uh, this is more on validating your Scopus profile and reducing ambiguity. It's important thing to have a little bit of a quick background on research metrics. 
So metrics uh, are, happen on the researcher level, on the journal level, and on the article level. Um, it's very important to make sure that you are maintaining your researcher level and your article level metrics. Uh, researcher level metrics are like each index, for example, uh, your citation count count your output count and your average citations per paper. Your articles metrics are either based on citations or based on society or based on impact as measured by views, downloads, social media, Plume X and others as well. So it's very important to maintain your profile on Scopus. So if you go to Scopus now and, and you look for your profile, it's for free and you can uh, make sure that your papers are being reflected as long as those research papers have been published in journals that are indexed by uh, Scopus uh, and make sure to link your Scopus profile with an ORCID as well. Sorry. So uh, for Plumex metrics, it's, um, it's based on, you can capture the usage, the citations, the social media mentions and captures. So if your work has been featured, for example, in the media, it's, it would be interesting to showcase that on your uh, visibility or, or on, on your personal blog. And if that work is related to a funded project that you've mentioned, it might be interesting to mention as well. Um, but just know that when it comes to metrics, things can work with some limitations. So there are differences between metrics as per field. So for example, citations happen diff differently in genetics versus mathematics, for example. So you can see with genetics, it gets very high in short time, but it starts to dwindle. Whereas in mathematics, it just grows very, very slowly over the time. Uh, to accumulate. So that will lead, so metrics could, should be used within the same discipline to compare with one another. Um, and there is a difference in rates of citation per publication type. Review papers attract much more than journal articles, for example. Um, another uh, thing is that, um, let's say that we have um, 100 people on call now, for example. And let's say that our average income is X, uh, but if we have just one person dialing in with us, for example, let's say Bill Gates, then our average uh, income, all hundred of us will be a few million dollars, for example. So it, outliers could lead to some misinterpretation when it comes to metrics. If you have a very strong paper, but you're, uh, then it can shift your entire field weight citation impact, for example. So people, when they check metrics, they will be very wary to look if there are just outlier performance papers or if you are consistently strong with many of your publications as well. So what do funders expect? It's a little bit of a small equation. Successful proposal is a great idea. Targeting the right funder with the right budget, the right team in place to deliver, and it's well written to it. Part of checking the credibility of the team is the metrics themselves. So they would expect the right team to do the work. And um, it's, it's very important to define your expertise. Uh, having a team uh, with the topics, research areas, publication sets from your, uh, from your area, identify key contributors to the specific area required, use metrics to see the metrics of the post outputs and impacts from previous people as well. Um, if you have access to SciVal, for example, SciVal will tell you, um, will look for m uh, good matches that will likely have higher uh, impact. So a good collaboration. If my, uh, if my field weight citation impact or my own metrics are, uh, I get citations 50% uh, above average. And another one gets 40% uh, above average. Our common work should be twice the average or a field weight citation impact of two. So a good collaboration is when your common work's impact surpasses everyone working on their own. People are looking for leverage on their money. 
So they are usually looking for industrial or similar collaboration as well. And they are looking for impact and legacy coming out of this research. Part of it is being presented by the Plumex metrics I, I mentioned before. So there is the academic impact, um, citations, downloads, reads, uh, and, and other kinds of research metrics, but they are looking for promotion and buzz, for example, social media, educational impact, societal impact, commercial impact as in patents, for example, uh, or startups or spin-offs for or tech transfer. They're looking for innovation, patents filed and granted, and they are looking for informational impact, for example. So these are different metrics that funders would be looking for. So that brings me to the end of my presentation here today. Uh, it's very uh, important to follow golden rules when it comes to research metrics to apply uh, multiple metrics and combine them with qualitative assessment. Start with the question needing answered and use the metrics when appropriate to the question. Know what the metrics are and are not showing and use all evidence available, be clear, specific, and build a coherent narrative to provide context. So if you have any questions, please leave them on chat. And um, to get your certificates for our presentation, for our session today, you can visit researcheracademy.com, which is Elsevier free training uh, website. There are a lot of training courses from Elsevier on funding specifically. Uh, so you can go and enroll and you'll receive certificates when you're finishing those electronic courses online as well. If you have an account on researcheracademy.com and you want to get the certificate for this session, once you are logged in, please visit in a new tab, bit.ly slash ELS dash AH dash 190321. That's today's date. Um, there is a read uh, how to get your certificate file that should show, I guess. Um, let me double check it. Um, and um, if, when you visit this link, you will have a survey. It takes about four minutes to get through. So once you have done, you, know, you finished your survey, you'll be sent to a page where you can use this six letter claim code to uh, order your certificate from Researcher Academy. So I'm going to leave this on screen for uh, for uh, for a couple of minutes. And please, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them on chat. Um, Any questions? Okay, this session has really been insightful. So if you have any questions, thank you so much, Khalid, for offering such an insightful session to us. Um, if you have any questions, please, can you use the chat? Can you put it on chat? If you have questions about um, the tips for assessing research funding, if you have questions about how you can improve your metric, just leave it on chat so that um, the facilitator can take that. And um, the recording will be made available on Academic Hive's YouTube channel. So you just subscribe to Academic Hive channel on YouTube and you'll find the recording. It's also currently being streamed live on Facebook. So you can always rewatch the session, even on Facebook. Okay, so we have a question for you, Khalid. Um, I'll just read it out for you right now. We have some couple of questions. So the first says, can you talk a little about how to choose a title for the grant? Um, so remember when I told you some funders are conservative and some funders like wild, crazy ideas. So it's very important when you're putting a title for your grant proposal is to look into that. Um, one good way to check this, if you visit O Grants, check for titles that work with this specific funder. Also, without even O Grants, if you check the funder's website, they will have a record of the grant for the projects that they have funded before. 
So if they like like wild, crazy, eye-catching ideas, then uh, you will see that these were the titles that they have funded before. Um, some like projects that will have an acronym. I've seen funders who like any project should have an acronym that is a word, a fancy word acronym kind of thing. So look, it, it would differ by each funders and, and their, um, uh, so I, I would strongly recommend to check the titles that work to see, uh, to get a little bit of insight to it. All right, thank you. So the next question, are there search engines for research grants? So there depends. Mendeley till last December used to have a search engine for grants, but it was discontinued. Um, as for Elsevier, I know that there is funding in institutional, but that's not just a search engine. It provides analytics uh, analysis for what those funders are doing and what kind. So it gives you more insights about uh, how funders are working. Um, I believe there are other, um, I believe there might be other services as well available online um, to search for grants in specific, but um, nothing pops into my mind at this point. All right, thank you. So what is the best way to approach potential collaborators? So it's, um, it, it's, um, it's based on different things here. So if you are already well established, you know that you have the right visibility, the right research search metrics, then you can start approaching people in a cold way. And let me tell you one thing, if you are already going to start writing for a research proposal, people will be interested to actually check your email if it's discussing, everybody wants to get the proposal, everybody wants to get research money, um, no matter how, how, what's the GDP or how rich a country is, every researchers everywhere are looking for research funds. So if you have a credible proposition, you are an expert in your field with good track record, and especially if you have uh, previous uh, winnings, uh, pre previously won grants with the same funder. So if, I'm, uh, if I've won a funding opportunity before with that same funder, even if it was a smaller funder funding opportunity than a bigger one I'm looking for, then probably that means people will be more encouraged, for example, to work with me. Conferences, conferences, conferences. Conferences are built for this purpose. Conferences are built so that you can grow your own network of collaborators. Uh, joining uh, scientific societies, for example, and professional societies, anywhere where you can start small talk and discussion with someone, and then it spins off to talking about your own work, and then you go into, okay, let's work together, let's write, uh, there is a cool, let's start writing the cool, uh, writing a proposal for that call together, for example. Okay, so um, I think the last question here, I'm not sure if this is related to today's topic. Um, that's from Simeon. It says, why is it that papers published in Elsevier take long and are not easily accepted for publication? So it's a two-part question. The part about uh, why does it take long time? Um, uh, you can actually visit journalfinder.elsevier.com. It's a, it's a website where you can put the title, abstract, and keywords for your paper. It will tell you which journals at Elsevier match, your, uh, match the abstract that you've written. And very important, it will tell you the average time that these journals work. Journals work at very different speeds, diff depending on, the, on their si the size of the editorial board, the number of submissions they receive, and many other factors. But this website is really nice when it comes, it tells you the average time for the first response from the editor. And it will also tell you. Uh, it will also tell you about um, uh, the average time that the review cycle takes at that journal. About why things are not easily accepted. So Elsevier journals put in a lot of weight to the quality of papers they are publishing. So they they want to publish the papers that will have the highest impact in the uh, academic community. So yeah, that that that's partly why they could be very stringent at times. 
uh, about the quality of paper. And very important, know that editors, when they take decision, they have the reader's best interest in mind, not the author's best interest. So they will be looking for papers that will be exciting for the readers, for other researchers to read as well. Okay, so if I want to add to that, um, Simeon, so your question was answered exhaustively last year during the research bootcamp. Um, the topic was on how to get published, the secret of getting published with any Elsevier journal. So you can, okay, so you can, I've just put the link to that YouTube video so you can learn all the different publishing policies of, of um, Elsevier there, so you can know how to publish effectively. So you can find that in the link there. All right, so I think we'll take this as the very last question. Are grants grant limited to only individuals with doctorate degree? It depends. So smaller grants, individual grants, uh, in the eligibility, you can see whether or not they'll be applicable for people without a PhD. Uh, there are grants that are built for example, specifically for postgraduate students. Um, sometimes you're eligible to be a partner in a research as long as your PI, the principal investigator, is somebody with a PhD. So it depends on the eligibility, but there are grants that will tell you we are targeting postgraduates specifically, for example. Uh, I, I have had researcher friends who found grants that were individual grants. They applied as individuals, not parts of institutions. Uh, they only had the master's degree and they were able to secure funding to do more research independently as well. It really depends on the right opportunity and what criteria are there. Okay, so thank you so much, um, Khalid. I'm sure you'd need to go right now. <laughs> All right, so thank you so much. If you registered for this workshop, definitely you would have um, an email telling you how to access your certificate. And um, you can also send us an email at info at academichive.com. Info at academichive.com. Okay, so thank you so much once again, Khalid. Thank you, Elsevier. And um, look for, we look forward to the next academic high research bootcamp. Okay, so. Oh, okay. I think that's from my end. Okay, so, so sorry about that. That was from my end. <laughs> that was from my end. All right. Um, so that's the that's the link to the YouTube um, presentation or the presentation on secrets of getting published by Elsevier presented last year at the Academic High Research Bootcamp. So if you have any questions you would like to um, you would like to ask the consultant. Let me get by another medicine. She don't take care of your brother and come in. Feel free to um, put it on chat or follow us on our social media handles, Facebook at Academic Hive, Twitter at Academic Hive, Instagram at Academic Hive underscore, I mean um lower caps, and um, LinkedIn Academic Hive and um, YouTube as well. And um, try to get more information from, from Elsevier's Researchers Academy. So the Researcher Academy enables you to unlock your research potential. You can find useful resources from that website. It's specifically designed to aid early career researchers as well to improve their research competency. Okay, we'll call that a day for now. So take care of yourself and goodbye from Nigeria. Once again, I remain Julia John Iang, co-founder, Academic Hive and Lead Consultant. Please, can you show the link again? I didn't see it.
Please, Mark, can the link be focused on the slide again so that we can see? It? I missed out on that, please. Okay, which other slides? The one to the tip on publishing with Elsevier. Okay, so I'll just send that again on the chat. Okay, so you check the chat right now and you should see that there. There's my chat. Okay. Thank you very much. Welcome. Okay. So we'll close the meeting in four minutes. We'll close the meeting in four minutes. So. Yeah, so for those who joined or who registered for the two week intensive um, research bootcamp for the entire program, um, please, we're still gonna have our graduation ceremony this evening. So yeah, by 8 p.m., the usual link. So looking forward to having that exciting part where you get to meet all other researchers, collaborators and partners with, of Academic Hive as well and get a certificate for the entire bootcamp. And yesterday, if you missed out on the data analysis with our session, yesterday was um, uh, was a training on different um, data analysis or statistical software, SPSS, eViews, and R precisely. If you missed out on that, the R session was free and open to the public. Um, I think we can also share that if you're interested in watching that or you can benefit from the R session. It's also a certified session. So if you're looking at um, getting certified as a data analyst with R, then you should take advantage of that. That is also free. I'll put a chat, I'll put a link also in chat right now so we can assess that if it's of interest to you. Okay, someone say when will the next training be? Well, the Academic High Research Bootcamp is a bi-yearly or a twice-yearly program because a lot of resources are spent in making sure that it's worthwhile. Um, it's a paid program. Actually, the two weeks is a paid program, but the Elsevier session is usually free. Um, but it's a paid program where participants get to, get to learn the art of writing research um, learning data analysis and analyzing um, the findings, you know, and also learning how to get published. So this year, there was um, an interesting future where one of the participants stands a chance to win a $100 publishing grant. So it's quite interesting, but quite engaging at the same time. Okay, I'm just trying to put the link to that training, to the data analysis training. So I'll just get the link right now. Give me a few minutes, please. Okay, so that training was um, hosted or done by Dr. Jenin Harris, an associate professor at Washington University of St. Louis, United States of America. Okay, so that's a link to the training, the link to the data analysis training with R. So that's a link to the training. Once you complete, it's self-explanatory and um, there are access to videos as well, video demonstration. So if you are interested in learning R 
and um, getting a certificate in R, then you should click this link, follow the training. On completion of your task, you submit your work file and um, get a certificate from um, John and Harris of Washington University of St. Louis, United States for this program. So I think I put that in chat. Okay, so I'm gonna put it. Oh, sorry, I'm sending it to people in the waiting room. Everyone in meeting. Okay, here. Okay, so I hope you can see the link to the training right now. So we look forward to having you join the next edition of the Research Bootcamp, which may likely come up sometime in October, possibly. And uh, But before then, you can follow us on Academic Hive across all social media platforms. Follow us on Academic Hive as seen in your screen across all social media platforms so you can get updated when there are new programs, new resources, new information. And um, check our website, academichive.com for information to research and scholarly opportunities you can take advantage of as an early career. All right, we call this a day. Thank you for attending. Goodbye. Okay, I can see a question in the chat. Is the R session for free? Yes, it's for free. That training was free and the certificate is free as well. So you receive an email on how to assess the certificate for this session. So long as you registered for this workshop, you will receive a, an email on how to get set your certificate for this workshop. So watch out for that email, it's gonna be quite comprehensive and so you can retrieve your, your certificate for this workshop. All right.